And so this year, I believe the focus for us as a church in the midst of reaching and raising in a challenging world that we live in today, the call is for us to live steadfastly or living steadfast and living strategic. And that is so important. As Christians, a lot of times we lose sight of that. You know, with all the clamors and noise and trying to survive in this new world, and yet we live in a world today where deceit and deception is so high, where truth, which is narrow in the past, now has been converted because I don't like that, so I'm going to change it to fit to what I like. And that's where the world is today, especially in the West. And slowly and surely it will creep into the East. Amen? And so it's important for us to be Christians who are living steadfast and strategic. And so today we want to talk about steadfast. How many of you have handphones here? I know because it goes off during my sermon sometimes. Yeah. How many of you love your handphones to be working sometimes? How about your television? Those of you are football fans, Malaysia and Thailand yesterday, and it was working sometimes. <laughs> or in the midst of, you know, badminton thing, uh, you know, uh, uh, competition on, you know, on the TV, you know, and halfway, as he was going to smash, the TV switches off. Since your TV works sometimes. Or when you came to church and you know that your car starts sometimes. Shem, any experience with it? Starts sometimes. How about if your salary comes in sometimes? <laughs> or students, your group member in your team project contributes sometimes. For some of you, sometimes is a good thing already. <laughs> right? I know that from my daughter. La. Some never contribute anything. But sometimes. And you wouldn't accept that because sometimes doesn't cut it in life. Sometimes doesn't cut it. Look at these words. Loyal, faithful, committed, devoted, dedicated, dependable, reliable, steady, true, constant, staunch, trusty, resolute, unwavering, unshakable, unfaltering. All these are synonyms for this very word that we are talking about today called steadfast. In the Bible, when you read passages that has those ideas and those thoughts, it basically means steadfast. Another word that is used is patience and endurance. Call to run that race and we endurance. Patience, steadfastly, or patient endurance. All these words apply in our lives. And it's so important for us to understand steadfastness is a vital thing in our lives. Why? Let me tell you this. When we want to begin a relationship, you and I know it requires a commitment. Those of you who are dating, those of you who are married, you know. And down the line, you have a wedding ceremony. Commitment goes beyond just words. Put your money where your mouth is because it's going to cause a wedding. Or cause some people want to keep it small and simple. But still, it costs money. Relationship starts with a commitment. You would want the person next to you to be committed to you, yes? Yep. A journey. You say, hey, I'm going to go to Ipoh. Yeah, and your car is fading to Joho, something wrong with you. If you're going to Ipo, you make a commitment, yeah, I'm hating that. If you're going to start a race, you will be in that lane committed to finish that race. So whether it's a race, whether it's a journey, whether it's a relationship, it requires commitment to kick it off, to start it. But what holds it and what allows you to continue on in that journey and that relationship and that race and to ultimately to finish that and to complete that purpose is that word steadfastness. Steadfastness. And that's why it's so important. That's the reason why we talk about steadfast. Because today we live in a world, all over the world, not just in Malaysia, many Christians after the MCO have disappeared. They fall into the done people church. I'm done with church. I already know, nothing new. And you come up with so-called famous names of worship leaders who before that put out their songs now and now they put out, I just want to tell you world, 
that I have now deconstructed my faith, I'm saying bye to Christianity. I was telling them for the first place, why don't you just shut up? Just because you are a famous worship leader? That's the problem with Christians. We put them on a pedestal and they think that they are voice for God. And that's sad. I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I'm not saying they are perfect. But I'm saying that, look, we are facing a challenging thing that comes. The Bible says in the last days, it will be difficult days. And there will be many who will be deceived and many who will be listening to lying, deceptive spirits that will take them away. And today we see it so clearly in the body of Christ. And it's no longer a new thing. You read it. Perhaps in Malaysia, we don't get much exposure. But those who are online will probably read, oh, that worship leader, this worship leader, the father is a pastor, he walks off. You know, some of the pastors, famous pastors, their sons are atheists. They've been in church. And that's sad. That's sad. Now you might say, it will never happen to me. It can. And it will. If we are not steadfast in our walk. And that's why we are talking about steadfast. Steadfastness is important in the face of difficulties in life. Christianity does not hide the fact the problem is when we face problems, we have been preached a wrong gospel and therefore when God doesn't come seemingly to help you turn things around, it is God's fault. He didn't help me, He didn't heal me, He didn't turn things around, He didn't unbankrupt me. He didn't do all those things. I'm living. And so we understand that when we came to Christ, it was because of some physical blessing that someone say that will happen. You come to Jesus, uh, God will turn all your problems away. No, when you come to Jesus, you will have more problems. You might even die for Jesus Christ. Nobody told you that? Church membership in the early days, uh, in the early church, in the book of Acts, uh, is the number one requirement, willing to die for Jesus, you know. It's not about God refreshment or no refreshments. It's not about whether we have this seminar or no seminar that came or don't have. It is about willing to leave it all and follow Him. That's Christianity. And somehow or another, we have listened to the prosperity gospel, to the success gospel. God wants you to be success. Yes. And sometimes success means being martyred for Christ. Have you realized that? Today, very few young people or even some of the old people read about books on missionaries who have gone before, who have died in the field. Very few, right? In our early days, it's a requirement for us to read about how they went, how they gone, you know, how they suffered. We, we read about all these people and they, they would say, I gave it all to Jesus. They started and they finished the race. That's, so that's the challenge. In the face of false teaching and lies to the devil, if we succumb to it, with all the cults that are around us, we need to be steadfast. In being a faithful witness, if we are someone who, if people look at you and say, really, uh, you know, one Sunday you say Jesus is good, next Sunday you say Jesus is terrible, following Sunday you say Jesus and Muhammad goes together. You know, people are like wondering, what are you? you know? If you are selling Coke, then you drink Pepsi. Then people are thinking, like, what kind of salesman are you? It doesn't work in the world, right? If you sell Toyota car, but you ask people to buy Proton, for example, then people are thinking, like, what kind of sales guy is this? There's no consistency. Steadfastness is important. In being able to run the race well and finishing it, it's not stopping halfway and saying, ah, yeah, too much work. Lah. Let's stop. It's being able to serve and fulfill His purpose for us here. A lot of time we spend, you know, I wonder what God wants, what purpose. Guys, just do what is needed to do. That's all. If people need help, help lah. If people need to wash, God, wash lah. Whatever the Bible says, whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. We spend so much time meditating, you know, going up to the highest mountain, navel gazing and say, Oh God, what is thy divine purpose? And God is saying, get up and do it. That's all. We spend too much time. Maybe sometimes those spiritual gifts test is very fantastic. But sometimes those spiritual gift tests, uh, you know, hinders a lot of Christians. I'm not saying that so you spoil our shape workshop. No. It is just a guide. 
It's not the law, it's not a rule, it's not a stronghold. You know, if you have never shared the gospel before, obviously you will take evangelist kosong one. Yeah? And forever you will say, see, my gift is zero in evangelist. That's why I'm not called to share the gospel. Rubbish. Everybody is called to share the gospel. You might not have the office of evangelist. If you are a stingy poker, now you became a cry Christian. In first day, you do the test. Generosity is last for you because you have been always stingy. Fella. But now as God changed you, you do the test, you might not be that stingy anymore. You say, oh, I'm not a generous person. You see, it's not my gift compared to somebody else. No. Everybody as a Christian are called to give because we are children of God. That's where we need to be steadfast in order to be good stewards of the gospel, the gifts, and inheritance God gives us. And ultimately, steadfastness is so important in being his child and representative of God. Why? You cannot tell people about the steadfast love of the Father for us and do not reflect steadfastness in our walk with him. You get what I'm saying? You can't sing the song as a church, your steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, but your ceases it. You can't. And that's why it's so important we talk about living steadfast. If you want to reach and you want to raise people, steadfastness is a virtue, a quality that you and I need to have in our Christian world. Amen? Paul says this, look, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whatever happens, ups and downs, difficult and good, conduct, carry yourself worthy of the gospel. People look at you and say, you must belong to Jesus. You must be a Christian. Whether I come and see you or hear from a distance, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. And the word stand firm has the idea of standing true and being steadfast in one spirit. And I pray that this will be a reality for us as a church here, as Christians. That God will say to high praise that I will know that you stood firm in one spirit as a church, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Amen? Don't lie alone, say it, no one understand nobody here. Correct or not? We need to be, people who say, God, let us be found standing firm as a cell group in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Standing firm as a church, standing firm as a family. That is so important. Amen? And that's why we are reminded that we need to live our lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let me go quickly to the next scripture. Peter says this, His divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life, godliness, through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. God has made it possible for us to get up from where we were before, our former estate, in darkness, in sin. Now he has taken us into his wonderful light. Now we are a child of God. God has delivered us now that we are in that rightful place with God. For this reason, make every effort to supplement or to add your faith with virtue, with virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. For whoever lacks this quality is so nearsighted that he is blind. In other words, whoever lacks this quality is so blur. Having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, Peter says, brothers, be all more diligent, be more sure, be more intentional to confirm your calling in election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. What qualities is, Paul, is Peter talking about? Faith. Virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, love. Practice these things consistently and you will not fall. And that's why one of that we are taking out is steadfastness as a church. We need to live steadfast. 
What is steadfastness in basically what you're saying? It's that quality of constant spiritual stability, okay, that a Christian chooses to have by remaining firm, faithful to the beliefs and principles and, and convictions of God's principles. In other words, the, this Christian has an anchor on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. So that when the winds and the storms and the floods come, that person will not be shaken. Even if it's drenched, even if it's being moved, you know, and, you know, and, and being soaked by the storms and rain and floods, but they will be anchored on that rock and not favor. We have an anchor. Why? And it's only possible when we choose to be firm, faithful in the beliefs and convictions of the principles of God. I told the youth, the young people before, I'm not sure whether they remember, that you, in order for you to be a man or woman of principles, you have to decide what those principles are now. Not when you come into a situation. For example, if you have decided that you will not sleep with anybody before you get married, no matter how handsome your boyfriend is, the answer is no. Because you have a conviction. Hello? Remember the word lifestyle? What is life? The moment you come into this world and the moment you die, that span of time is life. And before Christ, your life was styled by the things of this world and things of the flesh. Last of the eye, last of the flesh, pride of life, the Bible says. Now that you're in Christ, your life should be styled by the things of God and be led by the Spirit of God. So your lifestyle, everything, when, you know, when we are worship leaders, sometimes we have these nice names and we teach worship is lifestyle. Everything as a Christian in God is lifestyle. Huh? Because your life right now should be lifestyle by God. Yeah, not just worship, not just prayer, not just Bible. Everything that is of God is our lifestyle. Because we are now in Christ. Don't you remember? It is no longer I that live it, but Christ that lives in me. This life I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So there's only one lifestyle that you have. That is, as a child of God. We kind of miss that a lot of times. Okay? So that's why we need to be Christians who choose and say, this is what I believe in. This is what I've accepted. He is my Lord and Savior, and there is none other. I decided on the day of my baptism, the day when you were baptized, you were not just telling all your friends and family, I got soaked. You are telling the devil, devil now, shut up. I belong to Jesus Christ. It is a declaration, not just in the physical, but also in the spiritual. And that's why a lot of times I say as Christians, we are a bit MCC, Mong Cha Cha, Blur. We don't understand what baptism is. But if you ask a non-Christian, they can tell you, oh, my children can come to church, but I cannot baptize. Have you heard that before? They understand the significance of baptism. We Christians don't. We think that it's something we must do to get wet and then can become church member. Or it's a ticket to go to heaven. Now that I am baptized, don't tell anybody. One save, always save. I don't come to church anymore. Sad. That's why we are reminded in Colossians, if you remember in our study, continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast. Not move away from the hope of the gospel, of the good news which you have heard. We are called to continue in faith, grounded and steadfast. What do we need? Let me go quickly. We need a steadfast heart. Once again, in order to be steadfast, we need to have a steady and steadfast heart. The psalmist says this, My heart is steadfast. In other translations, my heart is fixed. Fixed on what? Fixed on God himself. That's all. The psalmist says, look, my heart is steadfast. My heart is fixed. I'm steadfast. I'm locked into God and God alone. Full stop. How many of you want your partner to say, my heart is fixed? Sometimes on you. <laughs> How about that? Certainly you will not be signing up for love actually. You'll be signing up for me with counselling.
That's the important thing to think about. We in the physical, we understand. In the spiritual, it's the same. What are your eyes fixed on? What are your eyes fixed on? Psalms 112 says this, verse 1 and verse 7, and put it together. Blessed is the man who fears God. That is the starting line. He is not afraid of bad news. Why is he not afraid of bad news? Because his heart firmly trusts the Lord. The man who fears God, his eyes are only fixed on him and him alone. And even if bad news comes, which will come, people? Did, don't you remember in the wedding vows, in sickness and in health? That's a pretty direct, right? Rich or poor? You mean bad things happen? Yeah, they say it at your wedding just in case you didn't get it. Yeah? And likewise, when we follow God, it's the same thing. For better, for worse, rich or poor, sickness or health, till death do us part, but in his Christian, we are with him forevermore. We follow him. And therefore, there is a need to be locked onto God. This scripture we all know, you will keep him in perfect peace, those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you, trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord himself is the rock eternal. In other words, perfect peace comes when our minds are locked onto God. In, then we have that steadfastness in our hearts that brings soundness of mind, not fear. And so we need to be people who lock into God. And say, How do we get a steady heart? Go back to the basic ones that we used to sing. We don't sing a long time. We create in me a pure heart and renew within me a steadfast spirit. That's what we need. A right spirit, a steadfast spirit, one that is locked onto God and not looking to the left and not to the right. Amen? And so how to walk steadfastly? We need to get our hearts right. And if we start the year, let's get our hearts right. Let it be steady. Let it be fixed. Let it be locked into God. So that when you walk into every church, every Sunday, you say, God, give me a right spirit. Gave me a steadfast spirit. Amen? Secondly, having a steadfast heart begins with a decision. Begins with a decision. Daniel 1 verse 8, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested for the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel purposed in his heart. Remember last week, Pastor Christopher Long talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Those of you can never remember the name is my shack, your shack in a bungalow. Yeah, so that's how I always used to remember. So you always remember the name. Shadrach, Meshach, Benigo. And they're all purpose in your heart. They make a choice. What did I said earlier on what is the definition of steadfastness? Is the Christian that chooses, the Christian that purpose in their hearts that they will stand firm on their belief and conviction based on the principles of God. And Daniel, even when they were taken away, exile, he purposed in his heart and says, I will not touch this. I will not follow your ways. I will still honor God, even in dire, impossible, difficult situations. When we read Daniel, we, a lot of times we tend to think, wow, it's a fantastic thing. Because we read from today's world and we see it differently. But Daniel lived in the enemy's land. And he had to serve a king that was not worshipping God. And yet, he had to be righteous. Knowing that in a political situation, people were waiting to kill him at any time. And we can see many times he was faced with that. But he purposed in his heart. And purpose is priority. Do we, once, do we seek first the kingdom of God? Is it, is it still our priority? I know we have to make money. Bible never say make money is wrong, please. Never. Okay? Money is not evil. That is the radio station and management training gurus that always quote the Bible wrong. Money is the root of all evil. And that's why they put their name there. And it's correct. It is their quote, not the Bible. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah? Whether it's Napoleon Hill or sorry, uh, don't sue me or whoever that puts their quote on Google and says, he said, money is all root of all evil. 
Yeah, it's just yours. That's true. That's what the world thinks. But God says it's a love. It's our desire. God never says that you cannot make money. God knows money is important in this world. No money cannot feed your children, ma. cannot pay rent, ma. cannot start your car. Maybe that's why your car starts sometimes. Yeah? But we need money. In fact, if you read Deuteronomy, the Bible says God gives you an anointing to make money. <laughs> to do business. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, God positions you for a purpose. But the whole point is that you should desire God more than your desire for money. <laughs> You've got to get your priorities right to seek the kingdom of God first and His righteousness so that your practices in your family, in your business, in your daily living, one that is righteous and led by the Spirit of God. So that when you are blessed, you say, it is God who makes it possible for me to prosper and do well. And even if I'm lack, in the midst of lack, I am thankful still that I'm not alone and God is still to strangle my heart. That, that is so important when we have the kingdom and we have this righteousness in mind. Amen? In order to, be, to follow up with a decision, a steadfast heart requires determination. St. Francis of De Salles says, whatever happens, abide steadfast in the determination to simply cling to God. We have to say, whatever it is, you know, like the old pop song, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Die, die. I remember I said this many times, there's a third stanza of the song we never sing in church. You know, uh, we sing, I can't remember, we never sing so long time already. I have decided to follow Jesus. <laughs> yes, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, yes. Right? And then it's like, the world behind me, the cross before me. You know, and there's a third stanza we don't sing. Though none shall follow, I still will follow. Yeah, we never sing that. Lest we all uh, commit the sin of words. <laughs> it's like, Though none shall follow, I still will follow. And the devil will say, Okay, let's see whether you're going to follow. And in the Bible, you know, you read, We have been lied to and blinded by a book publishers. That's why a lot of Christians don't do many things for God because they say, I'm not a hero. Nobody in the Bible is a hero. La. That word come about because of publishers want to sell books to you. Oh, sorry. All those selling books don't look at me upset. <laughs> but think about this. Hey, is Gideon a hero? If you interview a Gideon, are you a hero? No, la. I'm the youngest. I don't know why you choose me. I'm the smallest group. Moses, you're a hero. Jeremiah, you're a hero. Too young, too young. Nobody called themselves a hero. That's why the Bible says Elijah was just like us. Flesh and blood. People who had ups and downs. And the Bible never hides the weakness of the men and women who follow God because they were real people like you and I who had to remain steadfast and finish the race God had called them. When you get too caught up with heroes, then you say, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a hero. Obviously, I'm also not a hero. Yeah. So we need determination. So Isaiah 7 verse 9b, if you're not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. If you're not determined, you're not intentional, you will not. We face challenges in the world today. And that's why Peter reminds us, be sober, vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Resist the devil, but stay centered, continually, intentionally in your belief, in your faith. And that requires determination. Amen? Yeah, those of you who are losing weight, you know it requires determination. <laughs> yeah, I was telling Pastor Kareem, hi, yeah, uh, Christmas, uh, I realize the older I get, right? After eat two days in a row, right? Lunch, dinner, lunch, dinner, lunch, dinner, step on that beautiful machine, sucks. <laughs> you see, right? And I cannot afford to put on anymore because I bought new clothes, right? 
Yeah. So I was determined. And he said, I'm not eating dinner. And he asked my wife, I didn't eat dinner this whole week. Just to kill that kilo inside. Yeah. But it requires determination. And it was not even a call to fast and pray. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes people have more determined to do that than fast and pray. <laughs> but think about that. It requires determination in things. Likewise, in your studies, just to finish your project, just the last chapter you need to finish in your paper that you need to submit. It requires determination. Die, die, must finish it. La. Now, all students here, you generally know what I mean. Likewise, in the office, the things that you need to finish, you need to de be determined to finish it. Hey, sorry, uh, what's the green flag mean? Already? <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> Take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. We need to be people who are able to do everything, put on the armor of God and stand firm, be steadfast. And remaining steadfast requires deepening of our roots. And we are saying that many times, Colossians 2, 6, 7 says, as you have received Jesus Christ, continue your life in Him, be rooted, build up in Him, strengthen in the faith as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. We need to be, in order to, to have a steady heart, we need to be rooted. And we need to be rooted. We all know Psalms 1 yeah, tells us that he shall be like a tree planted. And any tree that is planted by a river, the roots go deep. It is prosperous. It does well. Okay? And what I'm trying to say is deep roots will sustain us through droughts. And it will steady us through trials. And it will nourish us to thrive. But we have to be people who are locked onto God. I am the vine and you are the branches. And there needs to be that connection that we need to have. So what have we been talking about? Steadfastness begins with decision. Yep. We need to have a steady heart, get our priority right, begins with decision, we need determination, it needs deepening of our roots. Okay? Let me quickly go. I know Pastor Green like, what? Steadfastness need to build into all these disciplines that we need. The Bible says we need to run to win. How many of you run to lose? Yep. Sometimes as church, Christians, we all play to play not to win. You know, you know what play not to win means. You choose to draw only. Yeah, you know we just I pass to you, you pass to me, pass to you, pass to you. After one hour, that's it lah. The ball pass all around, but we never score because we we didn't need to get injured and do anything. We just need to play not to win. And and as the church phase goes deeper into the these coming years, sometimes if we are not careful, we play not to win. <laughs> They just stay behind the four walls and we'll be safe. As long as we have this bunker, yeah, we should be good. We have food, we have refreshments, we have these things, we are good. And that's sad. That is called play not to win. Yeah, the Bible tells us run. Don't you realize in a race everyone runs? Only one person gets the prize, so run to win, the Bible says. In other words, finish the race. Get it done. Jesus said, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back. It's fit for the kingdom of God. This scripture was scripture that was constantly preached to us when we were young to follow God. Today, we seldom talk about it because, you know, I don't know. But if you want to know what commitment intentionality is, if you want to follow Jesus, follow all the way. Put your hand to the plow and there is only forward gear, no reverse gear. In other words, if you want to resurrect, resurrect all the way. La. Don't resurrect halfway and go back in the coffin. That's what it means. If you are following Jesus, resurrect all the way. Don't like, ah, halfway and then go back. And then halfway, every revival meeting, come out again and go down. You know, sometimes like, you would think that there are Christian vampires around. Me. Up, down, up, down, up, down. I remember this, com this uh, script that we had for drama. How this woman ran back and says, Hey, Dad, I got baptized. And the father, the father said, Again? <laughs> yep. Again? What we need to build up steadfastness is our faith, guys. Our faith. Bible warns us, cling to your faith in Christ. Keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately, deliberately means make an intentional choice to violate their conscience. And as a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. In today's world, there are many Christians who say, ah, forget it, ah, never mind, ah, no need, no need. Ah, I don't believe, ah, 
we deliberately make a choice to move back into darkness. And you shipwreck your faith. Remember this, when trials come, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Under trial. The Bible never hikes that this world has no problem. Jesus said, in this world there will be tribulation. <laughs> States there so clearly. There will be problems. There will be tribulations. There will be trials. Never lied about it. Only today we preach a nice gospel. Come to Jesus Christ, no more problems, no more trials. Mana da. Don't have la. That's why it is dangerous. Afterwards, uh, straight away, uh, then they go to cell group and someone tell them, oh, yo, I thought I'd come to church, no more trials and no more tribulation. The person told me off. Why? Uh? That's sad. Yeah. That's why the Bible tells us, as Christians, we are called to encourage each other. All the, you know, as we, we, we uh, and not turn to, you know, you, none of you have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away, but encourage one another daily. Why? Because we need to run the race with steadfastness, with endurance, with our eyes fixed upon Jesus. Yep. Hebrews 10 tells us, hold on unswervingly to the hope we profess, for we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Yeah. We need to, our faith needs to be steadfast. What else we need to have steadfastness? Our worship. We need to get back to the things of God. Huh? From the very beginning itself, the early church gathered weekly. Yeah. I know the MCO has turned many people online and after a while, some people cannot decide whether they want to come to church. We need to. We need to continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, fellowship, and breaking of bread and prayer. Yeah. Why? So that we can encourage each other all the more as we see the coming of the day of the Lord. And the word there, you know, not giving up together as some are the habit of doing. Consider how we may spur one another on, as I say, it's like you take a stick and proke somebody, you know, you proke the bubby. Yeah? And that's what it does. So in church, a lot of times when we nudge each other, is we are having fun. <laughs> but next time, when someone is doing you, when they are sleeping in church, you say, huh, wake up. Yeah? Step us in prayer. And I, I'm glad to see people are praying on a prayer chat. But sometimes we pray, it's also because of some emergency problems. That prayer has become sometimes like, you know, like the red thing there? In case of fire, break it. Yeah? And so a lot of people for Christians pray is that. So we, pastor, pastor. I say, yeah, why, why? Something happened now, please pray. After that, oh, thank you, God, answer. After that. No here anymore. The next time is, pastor, pastor. I say, why? Someone died. What happened? Because the only time you call, you know, you know, it's like that song, then something strange in the neighborhood. Who do you call? Pastor. You know, prayer has become breaking that. I'm not saying that you don't pray because no, you know, because emergency. Prayer should be just like worship, just like everything else, a lifestyle. It is part of your talking to God, and we need that. And that's what Paul says rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God. If you are praying as to what the will of God is, be rejoicing. Amen? When you come to church, reflect the joy of the Lord. Don't come with, like people with lack of fiber in your diet. Okay? Pray without ceasing. Give thanks. Be thankful. You might not have everything, but you have something. And you have the Lord. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen? Continue steadfastly in praying. Bring watchful in it with thanksgiving. Look at all scripture. Rejoicing in hope, enduring troubles, continue steadfastly in prayer. Well, how many times do you want to say? Yep. We need to be steadfast in prayer. Don't wait for other people to pray for you. Pray yourself. Even if you ask any speakers to pray for you, it is to affirm, to confirm, to add to your prayers before God. Yep. Don't, don't just be, you know, I just need someone to pray. If he pray for me, God will answer. And he said, you would think that every speaker that comes has a golden telephone in the house that says direct line to God. They don't have. No, Malaysia don't have that. Sorry, it's a joke. Nobody has this in the world. Yeah, all of us have the privilege to call God, to go straight to God in His presence. Steadfastness in resisting temptation. 
Temptation will be there all the time. Be alert, sober, your enemy prowls like a lion. We know that scripture. Yeah, And so if you say you are standing strong, the Bible says be careful not to fall. All of us can fall. All of us can trip. The temptations in life are no different from what others experience. The Bible says no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. Eh? But God is faithful. He will make a way out for you so that you can stand up over that situation. 1 Corinthians 10.13 Sorry, it's a wrong, different, uh, not wrong. It's a different version because I memorized that in a different version. Yeah, but we have that. God makes a way for us. But never say that we will never fall. And so when we are people who are intentional and steadfast, we are watchful towards those temptations that comes. Amen? In fact, actually you and I know when temptations comes, whether we want to bite it or not. We know la, it runs in our minds. And when after we run in our mind, then we decided to bite it and sin is a choice. Nobody here can say, I don't know, the temptation just suddenly came, slap my face, and then I swallow it. No. You and I know it is someone offered, something prompt you to consider. And because you consider, swallow it, you bite. And then the devil sings a song, another one bites the dust. So, think about that. Okay? Our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that you, what you hope will come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. And then steadfastness in doing good. Jesus went around doing good and healed the sick. And as a church, we need to be people who go around doing good and healing those who are oppressed by the devil. So if you have been doing good and wondering why nobody appreciates, let's not become weary in doing good. For at the right time, in God's time, we will reap a harvest. So don't give up. The call of God is always to be bearing fruit. Amen? Bearing fruit. So, why are we trying to say in being steadfast? Sorry, I'm going very fast. Huh? Yeah? It's don't live by feelings. Lah. Feelings come, feelings go. We don't live by feelings. We don't live in a realm of feelings and emotions. We live in God's reality called faith. Faith. Our operating system is faith. Yeah? Our iOS is faith. Only one version. The version is eternal one. Yeah? Keep the fire burning. You know, the one thing the priest does in the Old Testament is always to go and trim the wicks of the lamb in the holy of holy place. Trim it and make sure the oil is filled so that it will always be lighted. And it's our role as his priest, as his child, to ensure that trim, that wick in our hearts is constantly trimmed. And that's the business of sanctification that God comes and molds and sharpens, trims it. You never like when something trims it. <laughs> yeah? And then God refills, soaks you and likes. And we need that. Say, God, come, clean my heart, create in me, trim me, prune me. That's the whole point. So we need to keep our fire burning so that we can be a diligent seeker. Amen? That is what we want. What's the whole point? Because ultimately, guys, as James says, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Because ultimately, steadfastness is going to pull you across that finishing line. Understand? For the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. That's why Paul would say, I have fought the good fight, finished the course, kept the faith. And that's why we talk about being steadfast. We need that as Christians. We need that as a church. Memorize the scripture as a church. Can we do that? 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's a good scripture for us to memorize. Put that in your house. Encourage yourself. We are called to be steadfast, immovable, nothing shakes. Even the wind and storms and the dire these situations come and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Be fruitful. 
whether it's in your home, whether it's in your business, whether it's in your college, wherever God positions you, be fruitful knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The applause of this world might not be given to you, but the ultimate applause that counts is that of our Father that says, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and steadfast servant. You have finished the race. And so as a people, as we come, you know, in our journey with God, you started with commitment, let's keep running. And it calls for steadfastness. And let's finish the race. And it's strong. Steadfastness brings you back home. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. We, we know, Lord, many times we get discouraged. We stumble, even myself, oh Lord. We, we get distracted by the problems of this world and our own concerns and fears, so much so that, Lord, the enemy, oh Lord, prevails by casting imaginations in our minds that is not of you, thoughts that takes high place, oh Lord, in our minds. Father, forgive us. When the enemy's report sounds much better than yours. Forgive us, Lord, when we allow that to prevail and darkness seems to envelop our hearts and our minds. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. When we are stuck in valleys, Father, we cannot lift our eyes and see the mountain tops. Remind us, Father, O oh Lord, valleys, O oh Lord, are there. But, O oh Lord, within, O oh Lord, and above and around those valleys, are mountain tops, Father. And we are not alone in those valleys. You are our shepherd who is there. And so, Father, we may walk through those valleys. When we're going through, O oh Lord, dire straits, O oh Lord, when we are seemingly going through hell, help us not to stop, not plant a house in the midst of that, but, Lord, to walk out as we are reminded and not smell like smoke, Lord. Oh Lord, we pray, Father, that you teach us to lift our eyes up to the mountaintops in the midst of our valleys to see, Lord, our God is high and lifted up. And as we look beside us, our God is right beside us. And so we pray, Father, for that steadfastness of faith for each one of us this year as we start. To be once again recommitted, realign our hearts towards you and your purposes and your values and your word so that we can run the race steadily. Not encumbered, Father, not moving to the left or the right, but fix on you and you alone. To do that which you have called, oh Lord, help us to deepen our roots in your word so that our life is styled by the, your spirit. Our life is styled by your word. Our life, Lord, is styled, oh Lord, by your light that lights our path for us and not of this world. And so, Father, we commit our lives, commit our families, we commit this whole church to you. Raise us up to be, O oh Lord, steadfast Christians. People who have learned, O oh Lord, what it means, Father, to know that even if we falter, we can pick ourselves up with your help and continue running that race steadfastly. We want to be people like Paul would say, I fought a good fight and I will finish that race. So we pray, Father, this year will be one where we lift those weights and encumbrances that hold us back and say enough of it. That we move from bitter to better, from grouchy to graciousness, from lack, O oh Lord, to, O oh Lord, your sustenance. And to know, Father, that you are more than enough in all. That, Lord, we have a better life in you. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. That gives us that, O oh Lord, ability to run steadfastly. That your peace, Father, comes, O oh Lord, because our minds are locked on you. And our minds are centered on you, receiving that which is true, pure, noble, just, holy, praiseworthy of your name, of your word, so that it is your wisdom that leads us and your word that dwells richly in our hearts, Father. It is your love unfailing that holds us close to you, to know we are not alone. For if you are for us, who can be against us? So, Father, we commit each one of us to you. In our own different struggles, may we find each day the reality and the tangibility of your presence. To know we are not alone. Oh Lord, the warmness of your love. 
O oh Lord, the, oh Lord, that peace that passes all understanding, and that unfailing love, O oh Lord, the hoses and the joy, Father, that brings forth a song even in the midst of challenges, to say to the devil, "Yet I will sing unto my God," so that the prince of this uh, prince of the air around us will not prevail, and once again your banner is lifted high in our homes, in our family. In our lives, in our connect groups, in our church, in our office, in our college, wherever you bring us, so that Lord, I know, again and again, you are the ruler of my day and night, the Lord of my coming and my going. And so, Father, we thank you. As much as we receive the steadfastness of your love, let it, Father, pour forth to a world, O oh Lord, that needs it through our lives daily. Father, I commit each one of us to you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. In Christ alone, I place my trust. I find my glory in the power of the Lord. In every victory. Let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. Sing it one more time. In Christ alone, in Christ alone, Lord, I place my trust. My trust. I find my glory in the power of the cross. My source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. In every victory, let it be said of me. You say, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. Now as you go, go in His name. Go as His child, carrying forth His name, living a life worthy of the work of the cross each day, bearing much fruit for the glory of His name. Walk steadily, run that race effectively in love for the Father, grace of the Son, and fellowship of the Spirit of God. Be with each one of you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless all of you. Join us for a refreshment downstairs. God bless.